So um, I do want to begin and welcome everyone to coming this evening. And I also want to highly encourage everyone to put their cameras on as, uh, you know, from my perspective, the perspective. from my perspective, the, you know, it, it would be, it'd be great if we could be in person, but since we can't be at the very least, we can see each other and it's the, it's really the best way to help create community. So if you are, if you're able to turn on your camera, that would be wonderful. If you are in the process of eating, we understand, um, we get that. And so, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, you know, it's, um, it's, it would be great to see you. Um, so it is our pleasure to um, welcome to, to, um, to our very, to welcome you all to our very first primetime BI of, of the new year and of our programming season. And we're kicking it off on a high note. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth is, is that Dr. Rabbi Laura Kaplan, um, Laura Duhan Kaplan, um, is going to be speaking about animals tonight, but I don't think she will be on her high horse. How is that? Okay. Um, and it has been my pleasure to be a colleague of hers since, uh, since I, I guess, I, can't, I don't remember who arrived first, you or, you or I. You did, okay. So since I've arrived to Vancouver, it's been a pleasure of mine to be a colleague and um, to have her um, as a member of, of Congregation Beth Israel and to have her as a member of our congregational family. And of course, also to be able to learn with her and to have her lead us into tefillah and teach us. And, and of course, the list goes on. But uh, her, her full-time job now is actually at uh, VST. And on occasion, she'll even ask me to come and teach there, which I, of course, am just being a congregational you know, GP rabbi, a little bit out of my league. You know, it's not really... You know, but still, she's she's Rabbi Laura's gracious and invites me to come teach on occasion. And so I I can go on with all of the credentials, but of course the other piece, the other two important pieces is Rabbi um, Rabbi Laura went to Brandeis, which is you know probably one of the finest institutions that one could go to. And she also, of course, um, married a man from Pittsburgh. And great women marry men from Pittsburgh. That I can also tell you. So, um, Rabbi Rabbi Laura, please. Well, thank you so much, Rabbi Infeld, for that introduction, which was funny and even with a couple of new jokes. So I really appreciate that. And and, and so are you are you implying that some of my jokes are not new? Well, I might have heard the Pittsburgh one once oh, before. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I mean, once before this week. Anyway, I am delighted to be here on BI Primetime. It's a great name for a Zoom program. It's like primetime TV, except with fewer commercials and maybe a different theme song. I would like to share my screen for about, oh, 30, maybe 35 minutes, and I'll give a prepared presentation. And after that, I am open to discussion and questions and wherever the rest of the hour may take us within reason. Welcome. What to expect in this next 30 to 35 minutes? We'll open, of course, with a song because this is BI and people love to sing. And my man from Pittsburgh here would like to play the guitar. After that, I'll tell you a little bit about the book since this evening is 
partly a gracious invitation by B.I. to share a little bit about the book, Mouth of the Donkey, Reimagining Biblical Animals with you. Uh, then I want to reflect a little bit on the title that was chosen, not by me, for this evening's talk, The Experience of the Animal in the Torah. And then I would like to talk a little bit about general Torah interpretation principles, just two of the many ones that are available, and bring that to a focus on one animal story that is in the book, though we'll talk about some aspects of it that are not in the book, one animal story that is in the book and that just so happens to be related to this week's Parsha, which is Parshat Noah. And we'll look at it according to two of those principles of Torah interpretation uh, that I will remind you of, Peshat and Drash. First, the song. It's based on a verse from the book of Shmot Exodus, in which God is depicted as a loving mother eagle, lifting up babies, making sure they are safe from danger. There is a chapter in the book about eagles in the Tanakh, but that's not why we're choosing this song. We're choosing this song because it is one of the few songs that we know that sets to music a verse about an animal from the Tanakh, and we'll be singing a tune and a translation from Rabbi Jack Gabriel. Vahesa etchem, al kanfei nisharim, ve avi etchem, meilai. Vahesa etchem, al kanfei nisharim, ve Atem ti hulim am lechet kohanim vegoi kadosh vegoi kadosh. I did lift you up on loving eagle wings. I have brought you back to me. I did lift you up. On loving eagle wings, I have brought you back to me. You will be my precious one, for all the earth is mine. You will be a sacred family in touch with the divine. Forever, for all time, forever, for all time, forever, for all time. And in case you ever wonder what it's like to work at the Vancouver School of Theology, I will let you know that this photo of the eagle was taken by our president. Today's talk is based on the book Mouth of the Donkey, Reimagining Biblical Animals, published by Cascade Books. And if at the end of the talk you should decide you want to buy a copy it is available directly from Cascade Books. It is available from Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. And your favorite local bookstore can order you a copy as well. 
The title, Mouth of the Donkey, comes from a verse in Pirkei Avot, a tractate of the Mishnah that some call foundational ethical principles, although it goes way beyond ethics and into metaphysics as well. And there's a little passage in Mishnah Pirkei Avot that asks the question, how did all the magical things in the universe come into being? If God created the universe in a very linear, orderly, step-by-step -step way in Genesis chapter 1, and each thing was created according to its kind, how did unusual things that seem to overflow the boundaries of what is known about a species, how did those come into being? And Mishnah Pirkei Avot says, there was one moment, one instant at twilight between the sixth day of creation and the beginning of the seventh day, that is the day of rest. And it was at that moment of twilight, and twilight will come back into our conversation. It was at that moment at twilight that God created all of the magical and miraculous outliers that appear in the stories in the Torah, including the mouth of the talking donkey. And I like to say that it is at twilight when the world looks, at least in my experience, most magical and most unusual. The shadows change. It isn't quite dark. It isn't quite light. And we can sometimes see around us things that we don't normally see in our everyday perception. And I like to think of that as a metaphor for the twilight regions of our consciousness, where we look a little bit at the edges of how we normally perceive the world. And we see things anew in a different way, perhaps in a more imaginative way that then affects the ways that we see reality which was very much my experience of researching and writing this book over, I will admit, the last 10 years. In the book, there are chapters that explore stories about sheep, donkeys, snakes, crows and ravens, eagles, locusts, and of course, the famous oracle of the wolf lying down with the kid. And because this is written in a time when one of our urgent public issues, social issues, survival issues, planetary issues, or ecological issues, I also look in the book at how these stories speak into questions of sustainability, food systems, climate disruption, species interdependence, evolution, animal intelligence, and interspecies understanding. And some of tonight's talk will come from a chapter in the book called Corvid, Friend and Scout. Corvid is the name of a species of birds that includes ravens and crows and magpies and jays and perhaps some other birds that I'm less familiar with. Why did I write this book? I wrote this book for several reasons. Number one, I love Torah. And I love Torah both as a work of spiritual guidance and as a work of literature. And I love the many, many traditions of interpretation that have grown up that allow us to keep coming back to the text for more and more and more meaning. And so if you read the book, you will see that each chapter not only looks at animal stories and an important ethical value, ecological value, each chapter also teaches something about 
a different tradition of interpreting Torah and Tanakh, that is, Torah and the rest of the Bible. Uh, there are other reasons why I wrote the book, and I just have a note to myself to say, trigger warning for the next slide because there is a spider and a scorpion on it. So if you don't like looking at those, close your eyes and I'll tell you when to open them. I also wrote this book because I am extremely fascinated by uh, non-human animals. And these are just a few photos in recent year of years of me being with animal friends. Some are close animal friends and some are new animal friends and some like the scorpion are short-lived friendships, shall we say. But I find it extremely fascinating and I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, I will say a bit more about it later. And along with loving animals comes a very everyday kind of commitment to small acts of tikkun olam that relate to animals. These are small acts. None of them are big things. In fact, you probably do many of them yourself. For example, from the left hand around, raising children who appreciate and know how to care for animals befriending animals in our neighborhood, that is a crow with uh, um, accepting its daily peanut, being part of an informal network to find missing companion animals and reconnect them with their homes, eating a vegetarian diet, uh, learning about sanctuaries for animals at risk in human environments and supporting them, learning more about the small creatures that share our environment, and now beginning to learn a bit more about the role of animals in both threatening and preserving our climate. So I wrote the book out of a desire to deepen my love of Torah extend my love of animals, and do yet one more act of tikkun olam, bringing some what I think is important information to a different audience. None of these acts alone will change the world, but I do believe that each act that we do is an act of elevated consciousness that perhaps affects one person who affects another who affects another. A word about the title that was chosen by the BI team this evening, The Experience of the Animal in the Torah. What exactly does that refer to, the experience of the animal in the Torah? Does it refer to what the animal in the Torah story is experiencing? Now, I cannot tell you exactly what another creature is experiencing. I mostly am intimately familiar with my own experience, but I do believe there is a lot we can learn about what other species experience, how they process that experience. Of course, we can learn what there is to learn about what organs of perception that animal has and what information might come into them. We can, even if we are urban naturalists looking at the animals in our immediate environment, we can watch the ways that they behave, the times of day that they prefer, the foods that they like to eat. We can get a sense of their form of life. We can also watch the ways that they communicate with one another and the ways that they communicate with us and putting those clues together, we can begin to get a sense of what they are experiencing. Not to be inside their head as argued in a famous philosophical essay called What is it like to be a bat? But really in understanding more about how they live. And on a very Kabbalistic line of thinking. I do believe that 
each creature is an emanation, a form, a garment of divine energy. Thus, each creature holds a different wavelength, a different maybe note in the key signature of God. And each time we begin to understand a little bit more about what a different creature might be experiencing, we open a little bit more into our own spiritual consciousness. So maybe this does have something to do with what the animal in the Torah story is experiencing. The experience of the animal in the Torah, does that refer to how the writers experienced the animals they wrote about? In other words, were the animals in the Torah story part of the everyday life of the writers of the Torah stories or the original tellers of the Torah stories? Was there background information from their daily life that perhaps we don't know? So, for example, let's say we were writing a story about animals in our immediate environment. And I'll just give one example of animals from my immediate environment. Let's say, for example, an urban forager like a raccoon. I might well be telling an everyday story about a raccoon. Oh, they took the lids off my garbage can last night, even though I had the latest spring-loaded lock. And then, in the future, I might say to someone casually as a metaphor, oh, you can't keep anything away from this child, not even in the childproof, con childproof container. He's like a raccoon. And you would all understand what I was saying. But someone who had no experience of living with raccoons in the environment would completely misunderstand the metaphor and make up all kinds of strange things about it. Maybe you saw a picture of a raccoon. Oh, this child, it's like he has a mask on his eyes or something odd. You wouldn't know. And so we have to collect our clues looking across stories and seeing the different themes, the different contexts in which the writers describe the animals to get a sense of how they saw and understood and interacted with those animals. Maybe the experience of the animal in the Torah is about how we experience the animal stories, what we visualize when we hear them, what background knowledge of the animals we bring, how we understand the symbols. And if that's the case, the way we experience the animals in the Torah stories is definitely enhanced by our growing knowledge of what the animals might be experiencing and what the writers might have experienced. A couple of principles of Torah interpretation. I call them ancient and medieval principles because the principles of Drosh very definitely harken back to late antiquity and the beginning of the era of Talmudic Midrash. And yet the, what should I say, codification? It wasn't a codification. The beginning of the use of terms like Peshat and Drosh to talk about different approaches to Torah reading comes from the Middle Ages. We speak about reading a sacred text, a text of Torah, Tanakh, Bible. We speak about reading it in a way that helps us understand its pishat, literally its plain meaning. We might say that's something a little bit like original intent of the authors. What, in a straightforward way, did the authors mean to be telling us in their context? It might be a historical context, a social context, a natural context, the linguistic context of their time. And in looking at Peshat in the context of reading animal stories, the Peshat becomes clearer to us when we know some facts about the life of the animal in the story. Drosh, from the word to inquire deeply, related to the word midrash, 
which means both classical Torah interpretation and all Torah interpretation in one of those typical Hebrew words that whose meaning we cannot pin down in English. Drosh. When we look for the drosh level of meaning in a text, we try to bring forward some of the core values and teachings in that text. How do we find the drosh? One of the techniques for finding it is to begin to notice the words, the motifs, the symbols that reoccur across stories. That's how we begin to see the core values, by seeing what repeats and understanding the ways that they link with one another as a theme comes out of the background into the foreground by looking at things in what we call in modern scholarship an intertextual way, seeing how one text refers to another. And in classical rabbinic thought, one of the principles that makes it possible to draw from different parts of the Tanakh yet place all those pieces in conversation with one another is the famous saying, Ein mukdam umeuchar batorah. Nothing is earlier or later in the Torah. And partly the rabbis meant, we have theories about who wrote which part when, but we really don't know for sure. So we never know which story is borrowing from the other story. We don't know for sure which story is commenting on the other story. And so we will just take the liberty of letting every story shed light on every other story. And in a mystical way of thinking, we can think of the entire Tanakh as the speech of God. And God's speech is distinguished from human speech in that God's speech carries so much meaning. It takes us lifetimes and lifetimes and communities upon communities to decode it, to understand all the meanings that are in it. And thus, we use any clue that we can. Now, to begin to apply these methods of interpretation, we will look, in honor of this week's Parsha, at some of what the Torah and Midrash have to say about crows and ravens. This is a raven, a common raven. My experience with crows is based on local neighborhood experiences, in particular when the crows nested in our backyard. It's based on reading. This book by John Marsloff here is just one of my favorite books about crows and ravens, of which I've read many. And I even two summers ago with one of my children attended a three-day workshop on crows and ravens. So am I a little bit obsessed? Yes. Do I understand that not everybody who lives in a city filled with crows loves crows? Yes, but that doesn't bother me because I think they're wonderful. Interestingly, the Torah has only one Hebrew word for all members of the crow and raven family. And that word is orev. So I sometimes translate the word orev as corvid. The word orev is related to the words for evening, for mixing, and for pleasing. And I like to put them together in this way, that when you live in a city filled with crows and they've just finished their day of working and foraging in their family neighborhood, just before sunset, they begin to take to the skies and fly home in groups of 10 and 20 and 100 out to their big communal roost on the edges of the city where thousands of them gather to debrief the day and discuss what happened all over the city. 
And when that happens, I like to say, we look up in the sky in the evening, just as light is mixing with dark, and we see the crows flying overhead. And we, their fans, find this such a pleasing sight. And that's why the words for evening, mixing, pleasing, and crow are all related. It's just a theory. Crows and ravens have many similarities. They are both birds that are highly intelligent in ways that are familiar to humans, not so different from our intelligence. They both speak languages that have been documented by biologists with words and syntax and a give and take of conversation. I mean, the words sound like crow sounds. They don't sound like human sounds, but uh, they are recognizable words. And if you're ever out, say, in a rural area in a quiet space where just a few crows are gathering, you'll have the opportunity to hear their language. They don't use it that much in the city. Crows and ravens have, of course, a number of physical differences, their size, their shape, the ways that they fly, the sounds that they make. They also have a few differences in the ways that they live. Ravens prefer the country. Crows prefer the city, and they really love being around human beings, and they like being in large community. Ravens prefer smaller community. And for those reasons, because crows like human habitats, I prefer to think of Noah's helper as a crow. I've just got to make my really cheesy joke now. There are many animals in the story of Noah's Ark, and most of them only have a walk-on part. Haha. <laughs> Don't use that one, Jonathan. Or Use it if you want. But there are two animals that have a more significant part, and those are the crow or raven and the dove. This is an idealized picture of a crow and a dove as friends. If you live in the city, you will know that generally crows and doves steer clear of each other. Uh, they have their own social mechanisms for staying out of each other's way, and I won't discuss those here. We'll focus on the part of the text that has to do with the raven. Genesis chapter 8, verse 7 in Parshat Noach. Vayishlach et ha'orev, vayetse yatsov vashov ad yevoshet hamayim al ha'aretz. And Noah sent out the raven, I prefer to say the crow. It went to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. As a child, I thought this meant the crow was of no use at all. But clearly, that's not what the Peshat of the text is saying. If you know anything about crows, then you know that going to and fro is exactly what the crow does each day. It goes to, that is out, to check out what's happening in its family territory and to forage for food. And then it goes fro, that is back home, to its big family to debrief the day. And of course, who is this crow's family on Noah's Ark? Why, it's that multi-species community in the Ark, and perhaps even um, a special friendship with Noah himself. That might be the Peshat. What is happening here, why the crow is doing its daily debrief. No one knows how crows live. He sends the crow out to check out the earth. The crow comes back, uh, gives the report. It's not inconceivable to imagine Noah as someone who spent decades preparing for his time on the ark and thus learned as many animal languages as he could. Um, I believe that is possible. So that's the Peshat. But here's a more drashi kind of question. What is meant by going to and fro until the waters dry up? 
That seems simple on the face of it, that the crow went back and forth each day until the waters dried up. But if we want to look for a deeper level of meaning, we can raise that question. And why not? If there's no early or late in the Torah, let's do a little intellectual and spiritual time travel into another story from a different era that stars a crow or a raven. And that's the story of the prophet Elijah being fed by ravens. Here's the basic story. King Ahab, who is most known for being greedy, acquisitive, and having no qualms about murdering someone else to take their property. King Ahab is confronted by the prophet Elijah. And one of the things Elijah says is, there will be no rain in this land until something changes. At this point in the story, because of this threat and because of other actions, Elijah is on the run from the king and the king's authorities. And so God says, you know what, Elijah, Eliyahu, get away from the king, go hide out at Nahal Kerit, Kerit Creek, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to drink from the creek, and I've instructed the ravens to feed you. And I interpret this story as ravens because they are more likely to be living at the creek in the wilderness. And this is exactly what Eliyahu does until the creek itself dries up because there's no rain in the land. And classic rabbinic midrash connects these two stories in order to give a deeper meaning to what does it mean that the crow went to and fro until the waters dried up. Let me share this with you. I'm just going to change the screen share a bit so I can see my slide more fully. There we go. We'll go back to the big screen in a moment. This is from Midrash Genesis Rabbah. Rabbi Yudan, quoting Rabbi Yehuda ben Rabbi Shimon, said, he replied to him, that is, the raven replied to Noah, Mishivo returned with answers, Tishuvot, you see the resonance of the Hebrew root for to go to and fro. Yotze veshov, mishivo, to come back with answers, tishuvot, all related Hebrew words. The raven said when he learned that he was going to be sent out to look at the earth, said, of all the cattle, animals, and birds that are here, you're sending no one but me. The raven is a little bit worried why he's being sent on this dangerous mission. Noah said, what does the world need you for? Not for eating and not for making an offering to God because you're not the kind of animal. You're not one of these food animals that we took seven pairs of, seven of instead of two of. You can see in this version of the Midrash, Noah is not a fan of ravens or crows. But here's what happened behind the scenes, according to Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, who's being quoted by Rabbi Berechia. The Holy One of Blessings said to Noah, accept him. You have to respect the crow or the raven. Why? Because in the future, the world will need him. 
Noah is not convinced. Oh yeah? When? God says, you're going to need the raven until the water dries up on the land. It went back and forth until the water is dried up. You're going to need him in the future because there will be one righteous person to arise and dry out the world. And I need him. In other words, in the future, Elijah will dry out the land as part of his resistance against a greedy, evil king. And that righteous social activist will be sustained by the ravens. And if we don't have the ravens, we will not be able to sustain our social action. As it is written in the Elijah story, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And then at the end, you've got a little addendum by two rabbis where one of them says, I don't know, do you really think that these were ravens that fed him? I mean, there's a city nearby named Aravi. Maybe the Orev was people who lived in the city of Aravi. And Rabbi Nehemiah says, absolutely not. They were definitely ravens, right? And the connection with the story of Noah proves that. There's a little bit more to this Midrash, but we won't go right there just yet. Last couple slides. There are still more questions to be asked about this text. These questions are not in the book yet because I thought of them after I wrote it. Something about a pattern of values, right? Looking at the drosh, we look for a pattern of values in the Torah. So this is a question for you. Why does the orev, the crow and raven, show up twice in stories where people are responding to an environmental disaster caused by human wickedness? In one case, the Noah story, a flood, which is God's response to human wickedness. In the other case, a drought, which is through the agency of the prophet Elijah, a drought brought out in response to human wickedness. Why do, do the crow and raven show up? Question for future thought. What can we learn about the importance of looking to other creatures in challenging times, particularly in times where the challenges affect aspects of the world that we share with those creatures? What can we learn by looking to these other creatures in general and to the orave in particular? And if you want to talk about textual resonance, there is a hint to a text that I do not uh, have a slide for, but if you listen, you will hear the resonance. In the prophet Ezekiel, Yechezkel, chapter 1, Ezekiel is traveling with the deportees from the land of Judah on their way to exile in Babylonia, and they're resting by a river. And as Ezekiel sits there, he has a vision. The heavens open up and he sees the heavenly throne room. And before he sees something that looks like, something that looks like a resemblance of a hint of an anthropomorphic God, maybe sort of sitting on a throne, he sees a vision of the attendants at the foot of the heavenly throne. And some of those attendants are what we now call angels, but they are beings with four faces, human, lion, ox, 
What did I leave out? Human, iron, lion, ox, help. Doesn't matter. It's laid here too. And their bodies are covered by wings. And these creatures, which Ezekiel calls chayot, which is one of the Hebrew words for animals, these creatures are going not yatso vashov, like the crow, but they are going ratso vashov. They are dashing to and fro in front of the heavenly throne. And it is a reasonable assumption that the prophet Ezekiel or whoever wrote down the prophecies in his book was very learned in many aspects of Torah because he makes reference to them, including reference to a number of other motifs in the book of Bereshit Genesis. And that he intentionally is trying to make a connection between these heavenly beings and the work that crows and ravens are doing on the planet. And thus, this opens us up into perhaps creating our own contemporary midrash on the cosmic and hopeful aspects of crows and ravens. That is, when we are at a time when we are facing disruption, what happens if we look up to the skies and see the crows and the ravens going to and fro each evening? It's a question worth thinking about. Last slide. This is a photograph taken by Charles of Pittsburgh of crows over Vancouver. One other little tiny hint that I found in my fun close readings of the cosmic significance of crows and how their patterns of living are fundamental, if not to creation, but at least to, way, to the way the writers of Genesis 1 chose to describe creation chose to describe the very first rhythm of time that was created. Vahi Erev, Vahi Voker, Yom Echad. The most famous translation, it was evening, it was morning, one day. But take away the vowels and read it as it's written in the Torah scroll which comes from a time before the vowels were invented, and you will find the words, Vayehi Orev, Vayehi Vakar, Yom Echad. It was crows, it was cattle, one day. The rhythm of life. We see the crows come home, we go to bed. We get up in the morning, if we're farmers, ranchers, we tend to the animals, and that's what frames our day. The wild animals, the cultivated animals, the rhythm of our life is completely intertwined with theirs. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Rabbi Laura. Um, so I, I um, it made me think of a lot, and of course, this is just the beginning of, of animals in the Torah. By the way, I did a quick little search for you. Human, lion, ox, and eagle. Eagle. I knew it was a bird. Oh, my gosh. So um, <laughs> I, I have a, a couple questions and some ideas, and um, one actually relates to Pittsburgh, and maybe Charles can help answer this. I... I don't remember seeing that many crows growing up in Pittsburgh. And they're definitely there now. And I wonder if they're more of an invasive species to a certain degree. I mean, I know that they're natural, I guess, to North America, but they seem to have they seem to have taken taken more land and or airspace than historically. Is that I don't know if that's just my Pittsburgh experience or if that's true in general North America? 
It is definitely true in the Pacific Northwest, which is where several of the writers I've read on crows live. You could mm -hmm. describe crows as an invasive species um, if you want. The way the pro-crow writers usually speak about them is using a different unfortunate metaphor. They talk about crows colonizing a city because the crows come in and in a way they map onto our city uh, their whole their whole other crow city where they've got it divided up into which family owns which territory and who does what and there are some other bird species that they like and some bird species that they chase away they are however often at odds with ravens and i just spent the weekend in victoria where i learned that ravens um, hold the ground in victoria whereas crows hold the ground here. Hmm. Interesting. Just a small little water issue. <laughs> um, the, the other the other things I was thinking about just in terms of language and is number one is the mixing, the Oraverev, of course. Um, I, the Torah to me seemed and, and you know in certain recent readings, I think is a bit is more than a, is a a response to agricultural is Israelite Israelite religion is a response to agricultural revolution, and um, and much of that, of course, then brings domesticated animals and animals much more into human life. So we it was a very good as you were speaking. I was thinking about that we're eraving to as I like to sometimes use English Hebrew, right? We're mixing together. Um, ourselves with animals much more than we ever did and that may certainly be true about the crows as well which are sort of a, a good example of this and then and the, I, you know, I often think of and I apologize for what I'm about to say because you're a fan of but on the other hand is that I always sometimes think of the crow as the rat the, with with wings that it eats out of it eats out of out of um, garbage cans and whatnot but the reality is, is that I recently read an article in National Geographic about how the growth of human beings parallels growth of rats. And that the more humans there are, wherever you see humans, you see rats. And, and they go one and one with each other. They're in tandem with each other. And, and I wonder if that's the same thing with crows. And, um, and that actually, that crows really very much need us as human beings and their growth is connected to um, our, our growth as human beings as well. Is that? I think that's a really good observation. I don't know a lot about um, levels, about a lot of different levels of biological interdependence, but I do know that there are some species of animals who uh, do not mind living around human beings and particularly like the city because it is much easier to find food and water in the city, right? Not only are there natural pools yeah. of water, but we've got uh, pools of water in the gutters of houses. We've sometimes got cisterns of water that are left uncovered. We have water for them. And of course, a lot of the food that we discard um, looks just fine to them for their sensibilities looks looks great to them <laughs> um may, should we should we take some questions from the floor and then i have a i have a question that is going to seemingly be completely disconnected if we have time but i think is actually very much connected so potentially um there's a question in the chat yeah it's cd shaper um uh, did you think about the the compare to compare the crow and the raven with the native use of the crow and the, and the raven and their legends and their totems and their culture. Do you see a connection? Yes, you see I, see, I, see, I see two connections. One connection, and I just briefly mention it in the book, 
um, is with the Haida story, which appears in some other cultures, but I know the Haida version because yeah. uh, Bill Reed has made it quite famous. Yeah. Uh, the story of Raven Steals the Light, which is a story in which the raven is depicted very much as an animal that is very happy to live around humans, is quite clever and intelligent, and um, is depicted in a way that is consistent with um, everyday knowledge of ravens as we interpret it. Um, the Haida also have a story about being welcomed onto the shores of Haida Gwaii by a raven. And a parallel that I see there is, it's a subtle one, but it's with the use of the orave, right, as a, a cognate to the word that begins to mark time in creation. It's almost as if when we humans show up in the world or when other creatures show up in the world, we are welcomed into this container created by Erev or Rave. So those are some of the comparisons that I saw. Perhaps you see other ones? No, no, no. The, I, I see they, they respect the crow as they respect the raven and they are uh, um, the creator around it so much uh, uh, stories and legend. That is, uh, that's amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah. Agreed. There is a question in the chat box from Jenny Wright. It starts with a joke, Erev Tov. And she asks, am I relating to Canadian crows in particular? So the one that I, I'm not asking necessarily people to put their questions in the chat box. I'm just reading the one that is in the chat box. She asked if I'm relating to Canadian crows in particular. So much of the reading that I've done, and of course the crows that I know personally are the species that's called the American crow, as in North American crow. The crows in Israel are primarily hooded crows, gray bodies, black heads, uh, but their behavior is similar. Do you, do you think there's a chance that North American crows will make Aliyah sometime soon? <laughs> Perhaps they'll be stowing away soon, uh, <laughs> right, a boat near you. So, I think Ron had his hand up first. If... Yes, uh, not a question, just a, a comment going back to interdependence. Um, Mark Winston, our local bee guru, pointed out in a couple of uh, lectures he gave that bees in Vancouver do better, wild bees do better in Vancouver than outside of the city. There is more diversity of uh, flowers and weeds inside the city than out. And outside of the city, the um, pest control practices are antithetical to the health of bees. So there's an example of, of uh, for cities, uh, interdependence between an insect life and in in our lives. Yeah, thanks. That's excellent. I do cite Mark in the book. <laughs> <laughs> As everybody does. Yes. <laughs> I think the president had his hand up next. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. And and I, I, I somewhat apologize for part of this. Part of the, the, the benefit of the Zoom uh, COVID world as I was able to be out on a walk with uh, with uh, our dog and listen to your talk. And now that I'm home I, and I have some light on, I can turn my video on. And, and so I, I might not have heard of everything. Um, but one of the things I really was interested in is that connection between um, the 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 crow, the corvid, as you're uh, as you're calling it, um, and it's the it's liminal nature that that twilight uh, aspect of it. And so I, I heard you talking a little bit about this, that the, 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 the crow is neither beast nor domesticated animal. It's something in between. It's this, this liminal creature that lives with us, among us, but is not, in a sense, it's, it's part, it, again, it's liminal. 
Uh, and and then just one other way I was thinking, what way is it liminal? Is that you were talking about the crow and the raven, and one is communal and one is more solitary. And so there's that kind of like aspect of uh, of that human being is like to what extent are we uh, individuals and to what extent are we communal? And, that, and that's that kind of ambiguity is right there. So just some thoughts that were kind of going through my head a, a, as you were talking. Not really a question, but think. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And that might be a reason, another reason why crows are so fascinating. Uh, that they are so much like us as well as unlike us. Right? They need us, but they don't need us. And, and there's a, a lot of ways uh, to go with that because people sometimes ask me questions about the differences between the way wild animals are treated in the text and domesticated animals aside from the fact that domesticated animals get a lot of attention as food animals and so I think it will be interesting in the future to think about the crow and raven stories as those animals that are sometimes wild but show up right um, with us at at different times. So I'm going to take that for the future. Thank you. Um, before we finish, I want to thank you, Mary Laura, for your presentation. It was fascinating. And, you know, I, I realized that actually we this could be the first hour of, uh, of the next 10 hours on animals in the Torah. I mean, it's so it's such a, a rich, complicated um, uh, textual history that uh, it's just absolutely fascinating. So I, I, I now need to buy the book and uh, read the, read, you know, and, and I'm thinking about both the supernatural aspect of animals and the natural aspect of animals. That's all going through my mind. I do want to take this opportunity to also um, put a little bit of a plug in for our next prime time which is going to be two weeks from now on the fortnight, um, exactly on the fortnight um, uh, at 7.30 in the evening as I'm going to be talking in conversation with Russ Klein about uh, the state of Jewish education in the city. So, um, so I, that's going to be our, our conversation in two weeks. I, I just wanna finish with one last question. Should I, should I ask you a, a, what I think is a bit of a, of a spicy, interesting question related to animals, or are you uh, sure? Like, as long as it's not you, about Pittsburgh, are you ready for one out of left field? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. So I've I've often been fascinated by uh, the fact that um, that when an animal is is a victim of um, a bestiality. Um, that in the Torah and in Jewish tradition, the animal is put to death. And I've often, I don't know if, the, if you cover this at all in your book, I've thought about it at all. And I wonder, so you, I mean, you've spoken positively about it and, and clearly the Torah is trying to deal with, relate to interaction with, um, with animals. And, and I, I've, I've often, it's that, that has always concerned me that the animal is clearly a victim here of, of humans, and yet, uh, and yet the animal is the one who is put to death. And, and I wonder what this, what this says about the Torah's and rabbinic perception of, and that's actually what I'm most interested in in this particular law. Um, what does it say about human and, and Torah, or what does it say about Torah and, and a rabbinic perspective of, of the interaction of humans and with animals and how do we perceive the interaction of human with animals do we see animals as being actually like humans and therefore potentially guilty of an act and also likewise and i i actually never had thought about it and you opened it up to me um that the crow which i do perceive of as being the rat of the flying i had always thought of as the, the rat of the flying world until until you spoke about it tonight that that is the animal that then heralds in the coming of a new a new era. So, and again, an interaction with humans in that case in a very positive way. Any? So I have not given thought to the question you've asked about bestiality, but 
I'm imagining a situation where uh, young shepherds are gone a long time out with their sheep and this is how they um, satisfy themselves right. in as much as it's satisfying. And so I don't think that the rule has anything to do with um, thinking of the sheep as a perpetrator or um, a seductive animal. My first thought, and again, I have not looked at the text, so I can't answer from that perspective, but my first thought is that um, it is a worry about genetic mixing, what will be the future of this animal if um, it has a freakish and possibly debilitating pregnancy. So that's one, although you would imagine that it would be basic biological knowledge that uh, such a pregnancy couldn't happen. The other thing that comes to my mind is that there's an economic disincentive to doing that because if you compromise the sheep um, through your behavior, you will lose your shepherd job. And again, you know, many of the situations that show up in rabbinic literature are thought experiments. So we don't know um, exactly what are the specific cases that um, led to this kind of a discussion and conclusion. So, you know, knowing that, of course, would make interpretation easier. But those are my first two thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for a bit of a left field question, but, uh, you know, in particular, thinking about the interaction of humans and animals and in Torah, guilt and innocence and, sa and saving, thought it was uh, an interesting question to ask. And again, I want to thank you for, uh, for, for your presentation tonight and look forward to seeing many more aspects of animals and, uh, and their interaction with humans and, and a Torah perspective. So have a wonderful night. Thank you. you may, do people want to stay on and uh, say hello? Sure, I can do that. But you can end the recording if you Thank want. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Appreciate it.